Thank you all for being here, and thank you for the organizers. I'm just so pleased to see so many people turn out, and I know how much work it takes to put such a thing together. So again, thank you all. It's terrific. Good, organiz good organization and good job organizing of this uh, conference. So I worked for a very long time and created a nice PowerPoint for today, thinking how nice it would be to have your attention somewhere else. Um, and it would be all neat and tidy, and I couldn't make many mistakes because I could think it all through. And then uh, Mike told me that no one else was doing the PowerPoint, and the technology might not work anyway. So I said, fine, I can run with that. And I just kind of wrote down an outline and came in, and then Patrice covered most of that in the first talk. <laughs> right? Fair enough. That's good. So I decided what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a couple key concepts that haven't been covered. My job, as I understand it, is to connect speciesism with sexism. So I'm going to focus on that and the terms necessary for that and cover a couple of things that um, maybe can be covered in a way that will stick in your minds better than it touched on, but maybe we can give you examples or something that will help with that. So that will be the first part, and then I want to look at um, some applications of that in the last bit. And also, I've had the good fortune of, to meet a couple of people today that have asked some questions that I hopefully will be able to tie in. All right, so the first term that it would seem important to know is sexism. So what is sexism? It's discrimination on the basis of sex. And what speciesism? Well, it's the discrimination on the basis of species. It's all very straightforward, and right away you start to see the parallel. Discrimination. There's nothing really inherently wrong with discrimination. So there's a philosophical term here that might be helpful. <clears throat> it's the term morally relevant distinction. And in philosophy, it's a really important idea. So you can discriminate between individuals, species, sexes, but you have to have a morally relevant point for your distinction. So, um, for example, something that's morally relevant might be um, males should perhaps be given a chance to have checks for prostate cancer. Right? That's something that females don't need. So you can discriminate in that way, and it's fine. But if you're discriminating on the basis of sex, say, because you assume that women are emotional and therefore they shouldn't have certain jobs, A, is it even true? B, is it morally relevant? So sexism and speciesism are similar in that they are points of discrimination that are not based on um, morally relevant details. So that's the first parallel that I would draw, a very important one. And remember, discrimination itself is a good thing. We all need to discriminate in all sorts of ways. But we need to do it, especially where morality is concerned, in ways that are morally relevant. Dualism has been uh, brought up in several instances, and uh, maybe I can provide some examples that will hopefully um, stick in people's minds and make the connection between speciesism and sexism. And of course, ultimately, when we do that, we also uh, we get intersectionality. We get that this is just one of many connections. And when you understand the system behind it, it's all connected for you really very easily. So dualism. I have to thank Carol Adams for her work in this, and my favorite uh, book on it is The Pornography of Me. And in that one, she talks about A and not A. And I really like that way of envisioning it. So it's not necessarily male and female, it's male and not male. And I think that's a really important distinction. It's not, it's, it's not Caucasian and whatever else you want to put there, it's not Caucasian. And it's uh, human and not human. And I think that's just a, a very clear way to present it, and I think you'll understand why as I uh, give you perhaps some examples of that. So this idea that there is male and not male. So obviously there's a lot of karyotypes. There isn't just the 26x, x, and x, y. There's four x's and two y's, and there's three x's and two y's, and there's, there's just a whole host of different karyotypes out there. Uh, there's different, uh, there's different, there's intersex, there's different sexualities. These can't begin to be encompassed in male and female. Um, and the A and not A allows for everything that is not male. Now an example of this, just in this last year, was a, there's a lawsuit still pending as far as I know, 
In South Carolina, there was a little boy, there was a child born, shame on me for saying that. There was a child born uh, who was actually um, a hermaphrodite. And at 16 months, you know, he's gotta be male or female. This is a dualistic society, and you can't have this, this human that doesn't fit. And of course, if it's not male, Right? You, you have to have male and not male. So this is clearly not male. There's something different about it. So you make this one into a female. And at 16 months, that's exactly what they did. They uh, shortened the penis and dug a vagina in there and called this little kid a female. Uh, now he's eight years old and he's wondering when his penis is going to grow. So this is an example of dualism in action and, and the damage that it can do and how painful it can be. Um, I'll be interested to see how that lawsuit comes out because it's very telling. This has been going on for years where we get forced into one or the other. And this will help bring a change. This is, this is a good lawsuit. So power and denigration and the logic of domination. Um, examples of this, there's this wonderful picture that you can find on the internet of Bush signing the partial birth abortion law. And it's all these uh, older males, largely Caucasian. And so they're all making this decision for younger females as to what they, what's going to happen with them. And they look so happy and they're smiling and it's such a victory for them. It makes you want to puke. It's really sickening. So that's an example of those in power that uh, making decisions for others. It wasn't until the 90s that marital rape was illegal in all, all of the states in Canada. It was in the 70s. So again, that's insanely, it's just taken so long uh, because those who are in power have a vested interest in a, a perspective that doesn't allow for those kinds of protections. Examples also of this power of nomination and the denigration if you're in the not A side. Uh, so A and not A. So um, language is one of my favorite ones to turn to. So take a word like sir and madam. So if you look on the internet and type in sir, you might get you know, a guy in a uniform and look badges and all these stripes and what are you going to get from Adam? Somebody looks very much like a sexual object. Uh, so our use of language shows us who is the disempowered group. Other examples, bachelor, strong word, uh, old maid. So uh, they're very telling. This is something that we can do is change our language. We can make sure we use gal and guy equally. We can call uh, Anybody who's an adult female, a woman, and not a girl, or if we're going to use girl, then we need to use boy. So equalizing these terms somewhat and helping us and it can start conversations, too, which is a good point for um, bringing this stuff to the table. One of the points of dualism, um, there's three. One is this power of denigration. Uh, another is this multiplying effect. And the third one I want to talk about is association, all of which have been brought up. But again, uh, if I could give you some examples, perhaps, of them. So uh, I talked about the logic of domination, the multiplying effect. Um, an example would be, I like to use the example of my dog, Woggies, because it's a very safe example. So my little dog, Woggies, uh, is a pit bull, so she doesn't look right. She's got that head that says, look out. It's uh, kind of like a lizard. She has this wonderful kickball head. She's a female, so she's a not, uh, not male. She has black fur, and of course black is associated with evil, darkness, and death, and bad luck, and it's all part of our uh, kind of, uh, of our racism. So of course, adopt. If you adopt, please adopt rather than do anything else, and pick out the black one because there's a prejudice against them. She sat in the shelter for a very long time, she's female, uh, and she, of course she's not human, so she has this multiplying effect against her. And when I walked into the shelter, I said, which dog can't you place? And there she, there she was, bouncing up and down and rocking the other high and looking like a complete lunatic, and I thought, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily my sister was there and said, I got your back, so um, we took her and great dog. But it's an example of how things pile up against individuals in the not A side, making it you know, phenomenally harder in so many ways to function in this prejudiced society. And of course, an example all from the not A side, my little woggies. 
So the third one, association, it has also been mentioned, so I want to give some examples of that. Feminization and sexualizing of animals. So the things in the not a side, uh, women and animals are tied together, and you'll see the cow with the bikini on the advertisement, you'll see the chicken with the little apron on just waiting for you to eat her up. Uh, you'll see the, the pig with maybe a big breast doing a little jig with her big butt sticking out, and, and this is the sexualizing, feminizing and sexualizing of animals because they're in the not a side. Um, and of course you also see the animalizing of women that you can associate with animals or females will be done in nature too, our indifference to nature as not civilized, that our treatment of the environment fits in there. But with women, you'll see them, um, again on the internet, I see pictures of women dressed up like cows or like pigs. Um, much, much harder to find a male, so that's the animalizing of women, so the not a side and the associations between them. You can also see this in language, so again, thinking about language, the things that we call females, the derogatory terms like cow and heifer and biddy and chicken and bitch, all very negative. Uh, connecting women and uh, so connecting not male with not human. And of course, there are some for males dog, pig, uh, stud, downright positive stud. But if you get the feeling of the male terms and the feeling of the not male terms, the negativity of the not male terms is you can't miss it. So, again, think about this in your language and watch the words that you use. And, Maybe, well, I don't think it's maybe, I think we should not be using animals uh, according to our stereotypes to, to describe ourselves or others. Ourselves. Certainly not others. Probably not ourselves either. I'd have to think about it. So one of the questions, I think, uh, Julia here, Julie asked me about body image. So I thought, well, what a way to connect the two. So body image, you think of cow and pig um, and how, uh, how this plays out. I tried to think about it in her question. Historically, being fat was good. Back when we didn't have enough food, everybody thought it was good to be a fat female. But now that that's the norm, how else can you terrorize women but to always make them feel like whatever they are isn't quite good enough? So now they want us to be really, really thin. So um, looking at it historically certainly shed some interesting light on it. With looking at dualisms also, um, and association, you can see how um, our body image, our connection with sows and cows, and our sense of them as fat, and our tendency to fatten them up and eat them, this all affects our attitudes about these, this language and how we use it and who, how these are used to label um, uh, human beings. Not just human beings. So women's reaction against this. Um, it's an interesting thing. Um, when I, another question I got asked was about whether or not a matriarchy would be, um, would exploit animals. And I, I think that question needs more nuance. I think it was Nicole that asked that. Nicole, are you here? Did I get the name right? I can't see. Oh yeah, okay, good. All right, so anyway. Um, so I think the question that has to be asked is, should you have to, matriarchs are different. I know one in China and one in India, and they're, of course, different. And how, they, what do you mean exploit animals? Is this, like, keep them, and if they have a baby, share the milk with the baby, or is this factory farming? So that, that question has to be uh, looked at more, a little more carefully, but both of these questions, to me, it reminds me of my first talk I ever gave on this subject, and it was in Stony Brook in the New York area, and I was very nervous. It was, a, it was a women's conference, and I was the only person there connecting this stuff with animals, and they hated me. They just hated me. Now, looking back on it, um, part of that was just my own stupidity. I had no idea I was walking into a bad situation. <laughs> And, and, and there they were, trying to get together as women and build themselves up and somehow get their courage and feel empowered. And here I was, pointing out something that they needed to do for others. It just was not what they wanted to hear. But both with body image um, 
and with this idea of would women exploit animals, the sad thing is that women feminists too often want to remove themselves from the animal world in a hope to move over onto the A side. And this is, of course, the wrong reaction. This is systemic oppression. You can't just change sides um, and hope to get, even if you can change sides, can you feel good about that? Because you still know there's all the not A side and you know what that feels like. You've experienced it. So of course, this leads to um, kind of looking at a more practical uh, part of this. So statistics that I've read that people have collected that if you look to be up 75 years old and you're eating other animals, um, you are going to eat 2,600 of them. How many of those are females? Anybody know? Guess? Well, I did a little figuring, and it turns out to be 2,000. 576. Right, so no one can tell me that this is not a feminist issue, that this is not about being a female. So if you look at the life of, say, a cow, who is somebody sticks their arm in her vagina and forces her to be pregnant, dairy and so the so called dairy and the ones used for flesh. They are forced into pregnancy. Their babies are stolen. For those in the dairy industry, they're stolen immediately. Those in the not, the not dairy cattle, um, they're stolen after about six months. And where I live, I've seen this happen right now. The, cat, the babies have just been separated from the mothers and they're bawling and screaming and the mothers are bawling and screaming. And I saw one who escaped and was standing outside the fence where her mother was. And I, I think she'll be able, allowed to live six years but she'll, be, she'll have an arm stuck down her vagina every year and she'll be impregnated and for a cycle of about five years, both from the milk industry and the flesh industry. And then she will go off to be hamburger as, her, uh, as all the cattle do. So this, this type, the vagina, the womb, the milk, this is happening to her because she's a female. And this is parallel with the, sow, the sows in the pig industry gestation creates the fairy creates the worst of the lot. They live longer and they suffer more. Uh, they're violated sexually. Their wounds are exploited for their young. Uh, that the young are the young of the fortunate. They're shipped off and die young rather than the, the horrible lives that the females have to live where they're perpetually bred and for the sounds um, they're allowed to nurse for two to three weeks and they normally would be 15. Um, and we have 120 babies in a cycle of about two years for about, I think it's about four years, and then they're also shipped off to slaughter. Hens in battery cages, um, again, deplorable and awful. You think of the hens standing there. They turn their heads because their eyes are in the sides of their head. I can see them looking at little brown chickens and standing on there and, and wondering and watching. They watch their egg roll away. So all the ones that we eat, and this is just the meat, it's 2,676, I think it was. Uh, what about the milk then and the eggs? That's also all on the females. So the exploitation of animals in animal agriculture by humans is largely far and away an exploitation of females because of their bodies because they have vaginas and wombs and bear young and nurse them and they're being exploited to turn out babies that are stolen from them and then their uh, their the rest of their reproductive abilities continue to be exploited after the baby is gone intense painful emotional and physical suffering that the boys males never experience. And of course, I would never want them to. The little boy chicks get stuck in the grinder immediately. Um, the females go into the grinder, but only after a year of suffering, the broilers and the, sorry, not the broilers, the uh, egg-laying hens. The broilers are a lot shorter. So, in conclusion, understanding the theory behind this is obviously very important because they're connected. And when you understand the theory, you can work on your own life, look at your own life, look at your language, look at uh, ways that you can 
try to bring change first to your own world, uh, first and foremost to your own world. And understand, so understanding that theory is important, especially if you do end up dialoguing with others. And I find it hugely helpful to have some way of explaining theoretically why there's this connection. And then second, there's the application. So if people don't care about theory, don't understand theory, when you hear those numbers about female animals, when you understand what happens to the females and that it happens to them because they're females, well, then there can be no question that if you're an animal activist, you need to be a feminist. And if you're a feminist, you need to be an animal activist. And I will further say that beyond that, that once you start to get that, you get the connections, also the other things you need to work on with regard to race, with regard to the environment, with regard to those with property, those with all the privileges, all those who are on the A versus the not A side. And it's a long haul, and it's a difficult haul, and, and uh, I think we have to have patience with ourselves and one another, and work together, and keep learning and trying. <laughs>